once again make contact with our leader, Frank Levin. David, you're trying to throw me under the bus, and guess what? I'm not going to be thrown there. The problem with our country is we don't manufacture anything anymore. And we welcome you to what we are going to call a Pack Alliance briefing. Um, I'm here with L.B. Bork. My name's Randy Moggins, and I host uh, several radio shows on the Internet, The Threshing Floor, Off Planet Radio. And uh, what we're trying to do is to communicate some of the concepts that are pretty critical for people to understand who want to um, pull themselves out of this really steadily devolving system in the United States right now. And this is kind of targeted to the United States for reasons that will become obvious as we go through this discussion. The question becomes, are we about to see a suspension of the U.S. Constitution and what does that mean? And, uh, well, there's no better person to talk about this with than L.B. Bork. Welcome. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for having me and thanks for doing this podcast for PAC. Well, you bring, you know, you raised a lot of interesting issues in the article that you have uh, put onto the internet. And this is an article that, well, our goal is to get this to go viral. Um, people are asleep right now. They have no idea of what's going on in the background because they have no concepts of history anymore. And to remedy that, um, LB, you have put together People's Awareness Coalition, PAC, and also written the book, The Red Amendment, which is a book that not only breaks down the problem, but addresses solutions, something that we rarely see these days. Tell us a little bit about PAC Alliance, about The Red Amendment, where people can find PAC and where they can find the book. Okay. Um PAC and law was established around 1998. Its main purpose was constitutional education and political awareness. And uh, most people aren't aware that the Constitution was basically overthrown uh, during the Civil War or, or thereafter with the uh, Reconstruction. And uh, I uh, tell people there's only one word that people should be concerned with is Reconstruction. And uh, every, everything everyone is worried about holds its foundation in uh, politics or the uh, establishment of government and the law. Recently, I've been using the example of uh, uh, NAFTA and GATT. Uh, corporations weren't able to do uh, what they are doing now without the implementation of those treaties. So it kind of shows you that the law does work and the law is followed. The Constitution, of course, is the uh, foundational law of the United States of America. So uh, it's very important that it is followed. And uh, most people, like I said, don't understand that it was basically overthrown with the 14th Amendment and they're participating in a tyrannical governmental system. So uh, that is the main purpose of uh, People's Awareness Coalition, which is the acronym uh, PAC. And uh, the PAC Alliance is an uh, offshoot of that. Uh, after a few years, I had found that uh, people weren't willing to learn the truth or uh, follow what needed to be done, which is getting their status uh, of that of pre-14th Amendment and uh, so to get people involved and assisting getting the word out, I, uh, the PAC Alliance was created. And uh, I, I don't know. It's been going pretty well, but uh, a lot of people are afraid to uh, jump off the ship and uh, get back into real law. Uh, they, they're so in a, you know tied into this legal system that they've created under the 14th Amendment that it's very hard. Um, I, I don't mean to be alar an alarmist. A lot of people are. Uh, this uh, particular podcast is, is geared, I think, towards uh, where I, I want it, would like it to be is not 
an alarmist uh, type action, but uh, more information to get the word out because um, I believe that things can be altered or stopped if uh, if people are aware they can't get away with what they had planned. So uh, I think in this case, I think we can stop it. Um, A lot of people have heard about uh, upcoming constitutional conventions. my opinion is, and uh, I believed they were they have been planning this for a while, uh, that they are going to put a new constitution in place, but the problem is uh, the people are ignorant of the law, and uh, they'll get away with something that uh, is worse than the original one was, uh, you know, not even including the 14th Amendment, which really messed it up. But, uh, um, you know, we have to be aware in mass to uh, stop any uh, thing that's worse than what's uh, what's going on now or has been going on the last 150 years, especially. And of course, it's over 200 years. Um, uh, so that's basically the, the basis for uh, <laughs> PAC or the foundation. And in terms of this specific um, broadcast that we're doing, um, I sent you a quote the other day, and I wish I could source this better than I've been able to so far, but as nearly as I can tell, this is a legitimate quote. And it uh, says, this is referring to Patrick Henry. It, It says, he boycotted the Constitutional Convention of 1787 because, as he so eloquently put it, I smell a rat. And he suspected the worst, that the independent colonies that had thrived for over a century. I mean, people don't think about this. Everybody thinks about the country starting 1776, 1787. They don't realize that the earlier history of the colonies goes back nearly a, set, uh, nearly a century prior to those events, the prior to the so-called Revolutionary War. So he says, uh, worse that the independent colonies that had th- thrived for over a century were to be herded under one consolidated government, a vast government apparatus founded not on liberty, but on the bureaucratic dreams of monarchists and mercantilists like Alexander Hamilton. And as I, as I pointed out when I sent this quote to you, this underscores the distinction between the original intent, the original common understanding of those, those original colonies, and what eventually morphed into the constitutional form of government in the United States, which was at least an attempt to secure liberties and to outline proper conduct between the states and this um, the, the federal government. Um, but then, even people who have studied history, and, and you know, after I read your book, LB, I realized that even I was remiss in not understanding the depth of deception that went into the 14th Amendment. It basically took all the flaws in the original uh, Constitution and created something that we could just safely say is Frankensteinian. Right. Like uh, Patrick Henry uh, detected or felt, um, there were problems and there were a lot of changes made. Uh, my friend Joseph Roy, who this article we're going to talk about today uh, basically centers on, um, or ha- had written the article that uh, the uh, we're talking about today. Um, he did a lot of research on the Constitutional Convention. I have bits and pieces of it. I have not done deep research on the Constitutional Convention. My interest is more in the law that surrounds the 14th Amendment in that, that period of time, but even Joseph knows a lot more about the history and details of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, they changed words like they, they were going to use like national government and uh, they nixed that and wanted to put in the United States in place of it, uh, for one example, um, that was changed. Uh, I, I think it was deceptive. I've written some papers on the, the term uh, citizen of, of the United States, and they use that in deception, too, to um, kind of create this federal citizenship that was really non-existence from day one. That's what they wanted, the Federalist. They wanted this one nation under fraud. It's never been a nation. It's today still not a country. 
but the the political uh, news speak uh, that they've put out over the past 200 years, people believe it is a nation, and it uh, it acts like one internationally, externally, but uh, internally it surely is not. And the 14th Amendment is what changed that uh, basic uh, concept in law. They, they created this control measure, and uh, it's all based on mercantilism and uh, commerce. Um, you know, uh, that, that's the bottom line. And uh, as we have seen, they're calling people human resources today, and that, that's, that's based on the economic structure. <laughs> I've come, come to the conclusion that uh, all these economists, uh, if you go back and look at them, most of them are from... Uh, Germany, and Austria. Where the, yeah, yeah, Austria, uh, where the Ashkenazi Jews are from. Yeah, and most of them are. Even uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Bas 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 Basiat. Basiat. He was, yeah, yeah, he, Basiat. Yeah, he was um, even in commerce. Uh, his his parents were rich, and uh, he wrote the law in uh, about 1850, sometime around where the Communist Manifesto was developed which is basically the blueprint for fascism which is corporate takeover um, of this the government um, by by a capitalist uh, and uh, he was rich so he, he, the, the, these people are following these people and honoring them because they complained about the state uh, being an evil thing and really um, the people themselves are the state. Uh, we we are the government. We we are the the collective power. And uh, most of these people don't understand that. They think this this thing called government dropped out of the sky and and just controls everything. Well, they let it, you know. And that that's why I feel that uh, this constitutional convention that will surely be coming up soon, which I I think they'll definitely want to trip with war. They always do that. And uh, I, I believe a uh, revolution was created to uh, create a distraction so they could put new uh, mechanisms in place to control the people more. Uh, we need evolution, uh, not the kind that uh, um, the evolutionists preach, uh, but uh, evolution meaning uh, advancement of societies, not, uh, not uh, a revolution of control, which has been going on for thousands of years. By the same peop same group of people. Yeah, basically. I mean, I you know, I go back and look through history, and you realize that Franklin, and uh, Franklin specifically, but also Jefferson as well, were traveling back and forth between Britain and France during the same time that they were formulating um, these 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 founding doc documents. And uh, I, you know, out of all the. Um, Founding Fathers, certainly the man we referenced early in this podcast, Patrick Henry, stands out as pretty much singular in terms of his opposition to formulating the type of government they were going to do. Jefferson, at least in the spirit, seemed to maintain the anti-federalist stance to a certain degree. And then from there, it seems to just go all over the map. And what we wound up with... Even in the, the the early documents, the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers, was basically a battle back and forth between ideologies that one tended towards um, the rights of the individual and the other seemed to tend towards what I would call um, status quo statism. Um, not so much state as in having a government, but state in terms of something very monolithic and controlling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's uh, going to be a lot of people that don't understand, you know, uh, Marx's term communism, which I, I believe was just kind of a a tool they used uh, to fight the, these capitalists, but which, in, in fact, the capitalist were, was the plan, you know, that's what they had planned. And they just created this boogeyman and uh, got, a, you know, useful idiots to work towards the end goal, which uh, well, worked today, uh, very successfully. Yeah. Capitalism is extolled in America as the ultimate value. It has been my entire life. I mean, that was just pounded into everybody's head. We're a free country. We're capitalists. Um, but the ideology behind capitalism itself 
is it's just another monolithic control grid as well. I mean, the wealth mm-hmm. of nations was simply the um, antithesis to what was later published by Marx as the Communist Manifesto. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's a balance there. Um, if you talk to any Republican and de- or Democrat, uh, if they're not uh, very, you know radical types, they generally have a lot of crossover um, beliefs, and uh, which means they agree. Um, so the, the, the you know the Republican and Democrats are just a divide and conquer mechanism. They they've used to yeah. control everyone so uh basically there you know when someone's elected it should be the best man for the job there should be no party because um like i tell people there would not be a generation gap if things stayed the same and uh as we know the progressives are running us into this new age which ha, i can't see where anything's improved in the last 20, 40 years. It's gotten worse. So this transition, I have no idea what they have planned for this new age. It doesn't look good to me. And if it was good, wouldn't they tell us it uh, was good? Or tell us uh, and not hide everything and be secretive about it? That's the way I look at it. Well, yeah, and what we have right now is just the creep towards we've been in the socialist mode since well since the 14th amendment frankly but you look at the activism that occurred after the 14th amendment under the you know by the way under the color of capitalism go look at the history of andrew carnegie one of the wealthiest most successful successful industrialists of the late 1800s and yet carnegie himself was actively working and funded his own Carnegie Foundation to do nothing more than to promote socialism that would ultimately culminate in communism. And I'm not making any of this up. That's on the record of uh, the history of Andrew Carnegie and his foundations. So you have these capitalists who inside are basically communist socialists. And... um, all of a sudden you realize that that things that we thought we understood about the way our country work aren't real that w- what we've done is we found a mechanism using industrialism capitalism and now i guess the new culture of technology to basically continue funding socialism into communism and communism trending towards fascism so to predict the future i would say follow the trends and you're going to see that we are headed towards hardcore fascism in the next 15 to 20 years if things are not if things are left unchecked that's that's the direction we're going to take right right we know agenda 21 wants to get people into the cities uh, uh jefferson for example he believed in a, an agrarian culture and anything uh, that's above I, I believe anything that's above uh the land providing for uh, a people is materialistic and uh it takes a lot of money for capitalism or not capitalism but uh, um, I- industry and i use that term broadly or more specifically towards uh uh, mechanical means and, and things of that nature than mm-hmm. uh, and than than agricultural um, exchange between nations or something that could be uh, put into that category. But you know, when, when you start producing machines and that, it, it takes a lot of money and labor to do that. So uh, when you get further away from uh, you know the agricultural life or uh, you know the agrarian culture, you're going to be spending a lot of money, and that's that's what they did with this industrial revolution, which was uh, basically, um, I I believe it was planned. Uh, I believe it was a new form of slavery. It was simply another means to harness the, 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 the energy of human beings and put them into a collective where uh, goods could be produced and a financial system could be set up. Uh, If you go back and you look at the industrial revolution, uh, it was basically fomented out of uh, a couple of key issues. One was the, the beginning of, of the steam age and the ability to have machines that could do certain levels of work. And the fact that you had the crumbling feudal system 
and um, basically an agrarian culture that was induced to stream into the industrialized cities to be the the engines of production for what eventually became the industrial age itself. Right. And I'm I'm not against uh, machineries and things like that, but uh, as you and I have talked talked about uh, i i see technology just destroying us right now I, I i said to my dad one day i go if the electricity ever went off when it went off everyone would be a retard they they wouldn't know anything they couldn't do anything you know i i just think there's a balance there and i think uh um you know the amish kind of have a handle on that but uh of course they're a little um too religious for me yeah um it gets you know that's i don't want to get into the religion issue tonight but um anyway uh i don't think there's there's there's, there's a balance and and there is a balance balance. yes and i don't think we have to make the horrible choice of choosing but before we even get to make a choice we have to make some choices about how we want to conduct our, our our politics and our law because right now the key issues, as you see it and I see it, we agree on this, uh, uh, lie in um, the misapplication of law and the bastardization of law. We're, we're now in an era where most people couldn't give a flip about the law unless you know they get their head busted in a riot or they get a speeding ticket. Right, right. People do not understand that law is the foundation upon which the, the society is formed, and you cannot ignore the fundamentals. I think, uh, you know, people can work on handshakes quite often, but uh, the the maxim that I um, think is paramount in a maxim of law is something that's uh, gone through history, and people have pretty much agreed on it, you know, in in mass, uh, the collective, if you will. Um, It's called a common law maxim, so it's common to the people, is the... uh, um, the contract makes the law. That's the most important, I think, uh, maxim of law that's that exists today. So uh, the Constitution is basically a contract between the people. You know, there's people like Rousseau and others that talked about the social contract. Yeah. And I, I think they established that, that philosophy or theory or principle. Uh, I think it's more a principle because people uh, generally don't want to know the law. So they have to um, create a system of where they can be not manipulated so much, but uh, uh, civilly um, dealt with when the time comes. And, of course, uh, America, uh, a lot of the states anyway, uh, was founded on the common law principles of England. A lot of the states adopted the common law system for their, their general basic law system and of course it's uh, like I've told people that uh, it was never pure common law they always had some civil law uh, you know mixed in with it you know everyone's in in the movements talking about well the United States is a corporation Uh, yeah so what they all the states are too I mean the uh, the uh, Evidence is having the term citizen. Uh, citizen is a, a member of a, a municipal corporation. So all these people are preaching things that they, they don't even have the full story on. They don't understand. So, um, you know, I keep asking people, well, if you don't like the system we have, what are we going to do? Everyone's going to just walk the earth and be happy? Is that what you think really is going to happen? Uh, if if you put a hundred people on an island, uh, you know, a d- deserted island, I, I guarantee within a month they'd have uh, a system of religion and a, a government established because they couldn't get along with each other. You know, they'd have to put things in writing or establish some belief systems. Uh, you know, that's my my thought on that. I, and I have a philosopher friend that uh, agrees with that. I well, it, it seems too. obvious to me that the Creator seemed to think we needed laws. He gave us ten of them, and then um, Christ came along, and he sort of boiled that down into a, a, a triad that you could call law. 
that would be the higher law that people would live by. But the fact of the matter is, civilizations are based on a commonality of conduct. Um, and you have a term for that. It's usage and... Um, it's custom and usage. Yeah. That, that's not my term. That's their term. Or, you know, the term that's been developed by, by uh, the law industry, if you will. In other words, or, laws you know, that basically are, are, are incubated within the society itself. Right. And uh, we have not seen custom and usage law for 150 years. They've destroyed it by force. And basically, they're using it against us. I, I noticed I wrote a paper um, called uh, The United States and Its Common Law. And uh, the Department of Justice had a... Uh, on their header, in just a minute, I'll, I'll pull up the paper. Um, had a quote, and uh, it basically said that this is how they're um, controlling people with with the federal system. And I, I noticed they took it down. I went there the other day and looked at the quote, and it's not there any longer. But the quote was, and it was, uh, it, it can be found on a plaque that's. Uh, in Washington, D.C. I forget uh, where it was. It was on some street they pulled it off of. And I, I don't even know where the quote came from. Uh, someone said it at one time. I, I just uh, found it interesting from what it said and what, what I know the people means and the duality of the language in it. And, uh, it goes, the common law is the will of mankind issuing from the life of the people. And, uh, you know, we're, they're talking about mankind there, the will of mankind, then the life of the people. And uh, I believe the people, like uh, Blackstone said, the, the leaders or the, uh, the rulers have always referred to themselves as the people. And an American law or politics or patriot rhetoric, if you want to call it that, they, uh, you know, most uh, Americans think they are the people, but I I think they're the rulers. It does so, appear that way. Um, yeah, it does appear that uh, way. Mainly from uh, even the formulation of the, of the original Declaration of Independence, you know, right. the, the preamble. So, you know, they do refer to themselves as the people. And I've often wondered about this a famous speech by um, George H.W. Bush on September 11th, 1993, where he talks about the New World Order, and he basically says, uh, for us and our, uh, I, now I can't remember the exact, exact verbiage, but it, he was basically framing that speech that he made for us and our posterity, meaning us the elites, because these people view themselves as elites. So it kind of right. goes into that whole idea that there's a distinction being made even in the formation of the United States of a ruling class and, a, and, and, and an underclass. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Yes. I, uh, it, it gets back to what I said about people, um, them having to have a control system because people aren't interested in, in uh, following the laws uh, per se. They do what they want, you know, which is good to a point, but in relation to what we're trying to get across what needs to be done with the balance here um as i mentioned with the uh, getting after and gat treaties you have to have some kind of law controlling the state and uh the only way to uh suppress or or uh, put a cap on capitalism um you know uh, control it is, is have laws because um the uh, a greedy person is not going to stop and that's what capitalism does it it allows for um, things to keep going. And, it, you know, once you start forming uh, corporations, which is basically just uh, men creating a dead thing to take over, the, you know, uh, and have benefits or re you can either have benefits or restrictions. And that's what's happened. Uh, Congress has given corporations benefits. And all this was done with the 14th amendment uh, that that was the main purpose for the 14th amendment to create this this private law system where people are controlled and corporations also have the benefits of people so you know it's become become a monster and uh it's got no 
uh, control factors based on people basically being ignorant of the law and uh, electing these, uh, you know, politicians to go, you know, do their dirty work. And, uh, you know, all these people I, I keep asking are wondering, well, you guys want revolution and, and uh, change, but you don't know what happened. What's what's going to happen when when all this revolution happens? And all I see people doing right now is uh, doing basically nothing. They're not trying to learn what's happened to them. Uh, they're waiting for this this uh, planned crash in the economy. They're not preparing for. Uh, you know, they're not trying to change anything in their lives or whatever. So what's going to happen is they're going to become victims, and they're going to become, uh, you know, they're they're going to be at the mercy of these capitalists and the people that control the world. And they're going to be ignorant. And they're going to be jerked around, just as they were during the, the implementation of the Constitution. It's just the next step towards tyranny. And like you said, fascism, it's just an, going to be an increase of fascism. And uh, uh, I don't know. That's that's the nature of what this paper is about. It's to warn people, uh, pe people uh, of what's to come if they don't put a stop to it. Okay, so in, this, in the article that you include with the paper that was written by Joseph Rory, um, we go into a little bit of a discussion here about Jefferson Davis, who was the president and leader of the confederate states during the uh war between the states let's use that i don't like the term civil war I, it's, right it, it, was, it was it was in a civil war which it, the supreme know, court itself also stated yeah they they did it uh in so many words yeah they, they have they the civil war's political news speak again it's language that uh um basically is made up to get people to think a certain way. Uh, each state's a nation, and uh, they have their own civil uh, systems. Uh, for, you know, they're, they're, for example, there is no citizen of the United States. So uh, each state had its own citizen. So that, that's why it wasn't a civil war. It was an international war based on international rules, uh, the Constitution being an international document. It's nothing more than a treaty between the states or that the states have created a contract. So anyway. Uh. Yeah. So what, I, what I'd want you to do here is kind of uh, tour us through um, Joseph Rory's paper and tell us a little bit about uh, Jefferson Davis and what happened as a result of a 1978 proclamation by Jimmy Carter to give... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to give. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry. <laughs> to give. Uh, <laughs> to give um, Jefferson Davis's citizenship back. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 this is. The, yeah, it, it is. It is funny. It's so. It's ridiculous. But yeah, anyway, this this whole thing is based on Joseph Rory's research. He uh, made me aware of uh, the Carter you know, deal given citizenship back to uh, Jefferson Davis in, you know, 1978, I believe it was. Yeah, it was uh, 78. You know, yeah, yeah, which is, you know, 100 years after the guy passed on. And, you know, they, they say it's, well, it's an honorary thing. Well, according to Joseph, uh, you know, the research he had done, he said that Jefferson Davis spent his whole life saying he's, you know, or the rest of his life, rather, saying he was a man without a country uh, because these guys stole it with the 14th Amendment. But he was he, just saying, you know, he was the only one that was honest enough to say that, and nobody else seemed to realize that that was true for just about everyone at that point. No, it was everyone. <laughs> I mean, uh, he, it, it was a fact. I mean, uh, there, there was even uh, a statement made, you know, uh, I forget who said it, but it, it's it was hit, it was record. I, I couldn't find the word I wanted to use. It's historical record that, that it's a fact. But no one, you know, I, I've been telling people, well, wh where was state national society back then? Why didn't people form, you know, a society of people that that, that I'm, I've been trying to do for 15 years now, and no one's really interested. It seems. 
um, of people that have de jure standing and, and aren't p participating in this fraud or this forced uh, effort that they've done to take everyone's uh, custom and usage laws away and, and their sovereignty. I mean, if you don't have control of your political system of your state, you're not sovereign. So the United States did a whole takeover, but uh, this this Jefferson da Davis case shows that the Constitution had no authority to do that. So uh, that's the crux of why this paper is important, and it also shows that the law does work. Um, I, without going through the whole article, which is, is just a page and a half or so uh, that Joseph wrote, I asked him to write it. He uh, has done a lot of research, but he's never really written a book on any of this. He has all the knowledge in his, his head. But I think the most important statement or whatever is what he used uh, for a footnote that Salmon P. Chase uh, stated. And uh, he said in... in uh, uh, a book or it's out of a book it's out of a book that was a history yeah. of the civil war i believe right right and anyway he said if you bring these confederate leaders to trial it will condemn the north which wasn't really the north again that's it was the united states they just used the northern states as uh tools to get the job done anyway condemn the north for by the Constitution, secession is not rebellion. Lincoln wanted Davis to escape. And he was right. His capture was a mistake. His trial would be a greater one. So he was, uh, Chase was just saying, Justice Chase was just saying that uh, they would have to rule that uh, you guys had no authority to create this, this war constitutionally. And they did have the right to secede. So there was no treason by Davis. So, like we know, they, they'd stolen the states uh, from the South. And I, I keep asking, uh, there's, there's several people that say that there was, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, what's the word I want to use? <sighs> a conquering of the states in the south well technically there was because they put their puppet governments in to get the 14th amendment put in place but that was after this this statement was made by uh chase uh, yeah it was say, one actually almost one full year before uh, right. the passage of the 14th amendment i suspect that the 14th amendment passage had a lot to do with basically what i would call cover your ass tactic realizing oops we didn't really have the power to do that, but let's go back and correct it now, which is, you know, kind of the kind of the brunt of the whole thing. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, the way the 14th Amendment was drafted, there's a lot of uh, language from the uh, Reconstruction Acts, which were passed uh, to give the states some rights or, or limit what they could do, rather. And if you look at the language, I, I'm going to use one thing that's pretty glaring for an example, how they crafted the 14th Amendment to appear like it was the Reconstruction Acts, just, um, you know, copied over to the 14th Amendment. And it, it wasn't. Um, they, and again, it's political news speak. There was, you know, the language they used was, was false or, you know, wrong as a matter of law. They, uh, they, in the Reconstruction Acts, they, they said the rebellion. You can't participate in government of the South if you participated in the rebellion. And that's the one that Chase said wasn't really a rebellion. But when you go into the 14th Amendment, Section 2, they said you can't vote unless you participate in rebellion. So there's no specific rebellion they're referring to. Like you know, and, and the, go back and say that again one more time, <laughs> please. Well, well, you have to read the papers I've written on it. But yeah, they, 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 the rebellion's a title. It's a specific action, and the refers to that rebellion. But 
if you go back to section, if you look at section two of the 14th Amendment, it says you can't participate in government unless you participate in rebellion. It doesn't or say other the rebellion crime. any wronger. Or other so they crimes. use they use wor or other crimes. Yeah, that, that's a duality thing. They they whoever wrote this was a genius. Uh, the you know the uh, section two, three, and four. It's really convoluted, but if you know what what's transpiring. It, it it makes sense, and I covered that in my book, of course. But um, the, just a lot of deception was used to get this done, and like you said, they did it in a way that to to implement uh, the the people of the states of the not only the the, the South but the North to rebel against the Constitution. So now they they repaired their problem. Sort they of. Now, they, well, sort of. It, it's a fraud that people are participating in it. And they're not doing anything about it. I mean, they, uh, uh, the Judge Bork hearing that I recently listened to a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't listened to it until recently, and then that was happened back in the 80s. He basically said, everything's off custom and usage now. The four, you know, the, 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 um, the Constitution's basically non-existent in in ways of its contractual nature um but there still is an operational law like section two i just uh noted you, you, you don't have to be associated with these criminals and they put the expatriation act in place the yeah, and they, you know they that's the this. brilliance of this lb they literally label themselves here as cr as criminals and tell yeah, you they, that they this, is, this is a criminal regime. But it's done. I mean, you're right. The crafting of this language. And listeners, uh, we're going to put this stuff out. And there's going to be links with this. But you have to sit down and read the language. And if you sit there and scratch your head and go, WTF, it's because it's intended to do that. Because it is newspeak. It is double talk. It is con it's construction of language that I would say is diabolical, bordering on demonic. Yes, well, it is demonic. They say that uh, Satan uh, loves the gray area, and that's all this did is create a gray area. They did not totally uh, obliterate and get rid of the Constitution. Uh, they they overrode it in a way where people really don't know what's going on. And that's the problem we face with most patriots. They have no idea what's going on. You have the Tenth Amendment Center, which I think is planned opposition. They they say there's uh, there's uh, you know uh, what, what do they call it uh, nullification nullification yeah yeah nullification still and it, it's not existent now uh, for political means and, and legal means mostly. I mean, for example, uh, if a uh, county decides to not pay. Uh, or follow a certain law that the United States lays down, all they have to do is say, okay, we're, we're cutting off federal funding. And, uh, you know, they they don't get the money back, but still the U.S. citizens have to pay the income tax back where this, this funding's coming from. So they're getting screwed. And I, I've seen, I talked to someone in Oregon that's seen this happen had seen this happen. Um, they weren't following a federal law, and uh, they cut off the funding. The county had to raise the property taxes to make up the difference of the deficit for the, the revenue that they lost. So they're getting double taxed. So there is no nullification. Yeah, Congress is famous for doing this the, under the broadest umbrella. It's unfunded mandates, basically, because um, long after the funding runs out on the federal level, the states and local governments are still straddled with the obligations, which incurs uh, additional revenue raising on their part. And this is something, Pete, this, this is a health care system in a nutshell. This is exactly 10 years down the road where we will be with health care because there will be no federal funding. And they will not be able to sustain this health care system with the modest little taxes they want to lay on people right now but it will it, well it will destroy that system and it will also joy, destroy the ec the economic system with it so you know here again masterful job guys nice work yeah the whole thing's a farce at this time i mean 
Uh, they've got everyone voting. Uh, they they uh, bring in aliens or you know foreigners to make up the body politics loss of votes that they have. You know, people are starting to wake up to this. And unfortunately, uh, I put out this information, um, you know, 15 years ago, and half of it's getting diluted because people aren't tying it back to pack. So they're not getting the full story of why you shouldn't vote. You know, so it's really not having any, any uh, impact. It's detrimental in, in a, in a case, uh, fact because uh, they are bringing in these, these false voters just to make up the difference. Uh, because no one really knows the law and really what has transpired. Oh, by the way, the anchor baby thing is, an, is a farce, too. There are no anchor babies, and I've written a paper on that, too. I, I don't understand. These concepts are simple, and uh, I, I just can't believe the uh, law industry is that incompetent. Well, I guess I can. Yeah, I, I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> they, they don't bring out the proper positions to get this thing uh, nipped in the bud but you know even like I said uh, Judge Bork back in the 80s during his uh, nomination hearings uh, you could tell he was hedging you know he, he wasn't telling the truth he, he wasn't uh, they, they dance around it and that, that's what you have to do when you're... Well, you know, it's funny you know, because you now that you mention it, I, rem I remember watching those hearings. Um, I was at a point in time where I had my own business and I had a TV on and watched some of those hearings. And I remember those statements. And, you know, what Bork was telling them was the absolute truth. This may have, and by the way, Judge Bork may have been um, the most brilliant nominee to the Supreme Court in over a century. And that was why he was not, never going to be uh, uh, put it onto the Supreme Court, because he was dangerously knowledgeable about uh, the original formulation of law. Right. He, he noted two things that really stuck out. And uh, Biden, who was on the, the board there on the committee, <laughs> yes, right. who's yeah. a piece of yeah. crap. He's a piece of crap. And it's, sorry, President or Vice President Biden, but you yeah. are. Um, Kennedy too, uh, Ted Kennedy too, two peas in a pod right there. There's bad people, and uh, you know uh, they brought up two things uh, that Bork had, had advised Congress or, or someone about that uh, uh, were a problem, and one of them were the legal tender cases, and I. I'll briefly tell you about that. But he said that the Commerce Clause also was a mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. the, and uh, if you go back and look, the Commerce Clause has been perverted since day one. It, it's like a snowball downhill is what Bork was saying. And basically he says it's too far gone to even fix it. I, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but that's basically what he said. And the, as far as the legal tender cases... Uh, they said paper money isn't lawful money, but then the the Civil War happened. They put uh, Grant in there, who was a, a drunk and, a, and a just evil man. Mm -hmm. uh, he stacked the Supreme Court, got rid of the good Supreme Court justices, and then overturned that those legal tender cases. So uh, Bork had issue with that. So that's probably one of the reasons, like you said, he didn't get in. Yeah, those are dangerous positions to stake out, especially if you look now at what we're going through right. in terms of the the present currency wars that are occurring, the the hyperinflation, and you know the increasing public awareness about the just outright criminality and illegality of the Federal Reserve system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is all done progressively, and anytime you hear the word progressive, there are these people that are. You know, just slowly deteriorating the law that uh, is held under the original system, which is, you know, somewhat questionable to begin with. Uh, you know, like like you mentioned at the top of the broadcast here, or podcast, about, uh, you know, Patrick Henry, Henry walking out. So, it, it's, I, I don't know, people, the only way this is going to get fixed is that people understand the law. Uh, you know, I, I don't see the law going away like these anarchists think it, it's going to. I mean, even the libertarians, I recently wrote a paper 
uh, you know, uh, condemning them also because they basically participate in the system. Uh, you know, they they want liberty uh, for themselves, but uh, it doesn't seem like they're really interested in liberty for the whole, uh, which I am. I mean, we're affected by everyone. Uh, majority rules, and that gets back to that quote um, that I said they took off the uh, the uh, Department of Justice website about you know the majority controlling everything. They don't have to be voting; their actions control it. And uh, I don't see how they can. Uh, uh, you know, Bork brought this up too during the hearing um, about custom and usage over the past hundred fifty years. It's been forced or diabolically implemented uh, through control. Uh, for example, I know we're trying to keep this to an hour or try to uh, this broadcast. But, no, that's fine. Uh, Go ahead. Um, uh, one word they put in uh, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment was the word male. Mm -hmm. You had to be a male to vote. Well, Male wasn't used anywhere in the Constitution before. Custom and usage said men ha handle politics. But they stuck that word in there just so they could later put this women's rights amendment in, which is hogwash also, because it didn't give their women's Yeah, the right. early suffrage oh. movements. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, what's her name? Susan, Susan, Susan B. B. Anthony. Anthony. Yeah. She, she was just a plant that was put out there to instigate, start the ball, ball rolling on this whole thing so they could get women in politics. And I know women are going to be upset to hear this, but they, they had to get them. It's part of the Marxist plot to get them out there working so they could be taxed under the income tax. So uh, they could break up the family. That was part of breaking up the families also. That's the reason they had to break up the families. A masterful job. What a, what what, yeah. a, what a job they've done in our lifetime, eh? But my point is, they did it intentionally, and Section Two, uh, you know, like I said, they put mail on there just as a, a trip word so they could bring this uh, about. So, um, uh, the reason I did bring it up is because of the devious tricks they've installed into the amendment. Well, and I think you and I could agree on this. If custom and usage were followed over time, there would be an evolution to the place where women would matriculate into the business world, into the world of politics, and it would naturally have come to the place where they would have come to their own ascendancy in terms of voting as well. I mean, that to me seems reasonable and logical. But they seem to want to enshrine special rights, which is a divide and conquer aspect of all of this oh, definitely and i uh, just heard recently i hadn't had a chance to check it out but thomas jefferson supposedly uh wanted to do away with the uh, custom and usage of men the first male of every um, family have being the property owner or you know getting the inheritance of the property yeah, yeah. I, I think he he wanted women to have that uh, right too so you know, everything isn't bad in in nature, and I don't I don't think uh, women were oppressed as much as people have been told they were. Just like I know, uh, I read a book or uh, saw ex excerpts from a book that uh, blacks had businesses sure. in the South yeah. before you know during slavery. So you know they weren't oppressed as as much as people thought they were either. I believe. Well, a lot of our history has been colored, and that's a lot of what I think we're trying to do with these podcasts, LB, is to kind of maybe uh, take away some of the murkiness that goes on behind the scenes. So I want to pull you back here to Jefferson Davis for a minute and why this was important and how it shows us what eventually... Well, the facts... First off, let me put it to you this way. Jefferson Davis was not tried. Right. And so they had to come up with something. I mean, they've captured this guy. Uh, to the people in the so-called North, that would be the, um, the United States uh, government. 
they had their they had their their ringleader. So now you've got a politically dicey situation because you, you you're not going to put this guy on trial, really. So how did how did they extricate themselves from that little bailiwick? Um, Joseph would probably be better to answer that. I don't know what they did. Well, uh, well didn't we, it have something know. to do with um, a double? Uh, um, I'm thinking here that he was basically. Uh, they dismissed the charges, right? So they used, what, ex post facto clause to claim they'd have to dismiss the charges. Yes, and that that detail, that's true. Um, but I'd have to review exactly what that was. Um, this this uh, article that he wrote, I hadn't looked at it uh, probably in a year. Okay. So I yeah, well, that was it. what I, I was. To be honest with you, yeah, I, I hadn't gone through it and and reviewed it uh, even when I put this paper together last week because the uh, things that I uh, added to it or the rest of the story, as I call it in in the paper, um, kind of tie to uh, the overall concept and and not uh, the details of what Jefferson Davis had gone through, um, and. Uh, my main point was to destroy the uh, what Carter in Congress had done in, in, in 1978. So um, I think the most thing that uh, we can see from it is that they've repaired with the 14th Amendment treason against the United States because now people are citizens of the United States, so they will be able to be held for treason now. Um, under the original, where under the original system, they they couldn't be. So if they rebel against the United States, they they will be. And I I, I see a lot of uh, people trying to uh, instigate, uh, you know, re- revolution right now, which will get people, you know, put in prison, which is unfortunate. Now, that's what I've tried to stop for 15 years now. Yeah. Because this is the, the, one of the main things that I had seen when I started doing my own research. Uh, you know, I said to myself one day, oh, my God, they're going to get people put in prison now for treason. And even I saw it, even without uh, knowing that exact detail uh, that Joseph had brought out with the uh, Jefferson Davis case. So it's obvious, is, is what I'm saying, what they've done. They've repaired a lot of the things that they couldn't get away with, with the 14th Amendment. Well, I guess the takeaway that I got from the summation of the Jefferson Davis case is that they did not want to generate a court record on this. Right. Which would have clearly put them in the position of an historical record establishing that, in fact, Not just Jefferson Davis, but the uh, Confederate states themselves could not be guilty of treason. Hence, they were not rebels. And it would have created, I'm not sure what it would have taken to gloss that over had they done this, because the 14th Amendment wouldn't have covered it once it was on the record. They relied to a large degree on the 14th Amendment to basically repair their own deficiencies. And uh, they did it in absence of a good historical record. Right. They they had to, like I said, they had to get people to rebel against the original system and their political sovereignty that existed under the Constitution with the, fort, you know, of course, it was repaired or fixed with the 14th Amendment. Everyone is tre- in treason against their lawful government, and they're rebelling against the original constitutional system, which uh, makes them, you know, uh, as liable as, as they are. And they can't really, um, you know, they'll just say, well, it's written right there. You should have known, even though it's, it, it takes a pretty good mind to see it. I, I, I've showed this to people, and they go, it doesn't say it's a crime to vote. They don't want to believe it. They don't believe it's that evil. And that's, that's what uh, a lot of people are going to have problems with. Even Section 3, which this paper goes over and explains, there's two sets of officers noted in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the language is just, I don't know, you, you used to uh, be an editor, you, you mentioned to me, 
Uh, do you see it? I mean, is no. I saw it, it, it the it, first time you flagged it. I, I saw yeah. it when I read the red. And for me to go back over language like that, and I parsed the sentence. I mean, you know, here's the sad thing: um, we no longer diagram sentences. We don't really understand grammatical construction. We don't even speak right, much much less write well or speak well. So, you know, the average person looks at that and uh, they they go into kind of a, a trance state because they yeah. don't they don't really understand it. But if you parse the sentence, if you diagram it, and if you just go in plain language, what is this telling you? Then you begin to understand that yes, it's a it's a crime to vote, that only criminals yeah. can vote. But then again. Only criminals can vote for a criminal government that has admitted that they're criminals, too. See, this is, you know, when you begin to look at the whole juggernaut, you suddenly realize that um, everything they're telling you is the truth, and they put it right in your face, and you're not supposed to understand it. Well, it's up to speculation, too, or, or what what you think it means, like... Uh we go back to section three. Uh, you're talking about section two right now, or just okay. a minute ago. Yeah. Um, they're talking about uh, previously taken an oath. You know what? What are they saying there? That could be, uh, you know, is the the second they take the oath and they're done with it. The next second could be previously. It, it depends what your perception is of what they're talking about there, because they really don't spell it out. No, they'll wait for a Supreme Court opinion. Right, on what it says. And exactly. You're, you're not going to see anything on this. And th that's what people keep asking me for. Well, where does the Supreme Court agree with you? Well, they're not going to. They, they, they be, matter of fact, Section 4, uh, uh, it, it says they have to suppress the rebellion or rebellions and insurrections. They can't talk about it, in other words. Um, they have to keep it silent. So that's why they dance around the truth. You know, sometimes they'll say something that's pretty um, blatantly obvious of what they're doing, but very rarely do they spill the beans. So, you know, if you're involved in criminal activity, you're not going to implicate yourself. And the other, the other statement is. Uh, such disability remove such disability um in that section three of you know it's up to spec what are they talking about and the only thing i could figure is uh you know in, in the book uh the red amendment i i talked about um, possible um you know uh reinstatement of the constitution because they do call the 14th amendment uh, they they refer to it as an emergency measure well, what was the emergency really? You know, uh, they can make uh, claims all they want, but they really don't spell anything out to say why they needed to do the Fourteenth Amendment. And I, I believe they killed Lincoln because uh, I understand that he was against the Fourteenth Amendment, so they had to get rid of him so they could get this done. And that was all done during the time of what eighteen sixty. When did they shoot him? I forgot. When uh, Booth shoot shot yeah, Kennedy, uh, my, my, I, Kennedy uh, Lincoln. Yeah. But anyway, it was, it was all. It was there was a period of time in there where a lot of things transpired. So, uh, anyway, I, I, I that's the uh, you know the basic uh, notation in this paper is remove such disability and, and one thing that's they're talking about mainly in there is upholding the Constitution and. There's, you know, a lot of indicators where they're going to uh, form a dictatorship. The president's been a dictator, uh, dictator for the last 150 years, uh, and also that came up in the Bork hearings. Um, the the Congress, I think it was Biden and Kennedy, were wondering why the president had the power to overrule them in in a lot of cases. Just like the courts can overrule the juries, you know, they, the juries today are just a dog and pony show because they can over a judge can overturn their decisions, uh, you know, with a drop of a hat if they feel like it. And uh, the same thing happens with Congress. If if the president doesn't like what they're doing, he can uh, 
overrule it. And another thing that uh, illustrates, uh, uh, you know, dictatorship is the executive order. Yeah, Con control they have or power. So, well, Mr. There, Lincoln there, was there, actually there, the original president for doing executive orders, so he holds right. a little bit of that in his. Uh, in his historical record as well, because that was a function of the fact that you had a, a broken Congress at that point. Right. So there was a lot of unlawful things going on during that presidency and during that period of time. thing that uh, concerned me is when I came out with my book, uh, you saw all these uh, Lincoln books coming out and Lincoln movies. Yes. Yeah. And the, uh, to me, those are just distractions. Uh, they're trying to, you know, get people, but when you say Civil War, you know, you, you'll think of Lincoln instead of the 14th Amendment. So it's it's, it's a distraction or a, what they call a misdirection. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, I don't think you can deny that there, there have been a lot of books and, uh, you know, movies on Lincoln in the last 15 years. Yeah, some of them are pretty All ridiculous the too. Oh yeah, the <laughs> Lincoln, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln Vampire. vampire. Yeah, that was yeah. that was my favorite. But, yeah, this is ridiculous. Yeah, but you know they they have different uh, uh, psyches they have to appeal to, so they come up with different things. Yeah, you've still got to get the goth vote. Yeah. So um, to kind of wrap this up, um, take us into the to, into the uh, payoff on this because it goes into where we're at right now and what has been baked into the equation uh largely the progressive plot to install the final fra uh, final phase uh within the framework of the american governance to prepare america for what we would call social socialism or totalitarianism and then you you bring up title eight of the u.s code right that's the uh, evidence of which i speak and you know, you and I, Randy, have talked about the uh, the two parties acting as one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, basically, uh, Title Eight uh, of the U.S. Code, uh, Section Eleven Hundred One A Thirty Seven, uh, talks about the two parties with one face, and uh, it's defined there in in so many words. And this had shown up in the uh, the code around the nineteen forties, I believe. And uh, it was basically the Red Scare that installed these definitions, but things had already been transpiring, and uh, uh, these definitions they'll tell you are installed in the the uh, the code to keep people from foreign countries coming in to the United States and advocating totalitar totalitarianism or dictatorships, and then. Uh, of course, uh, A40 goes into world communism, which that's the ultimate plan of what's going on. And I'll, I'll just read that one quick. The term world communism means a revolutionary movement, the purpose of which to establish eventually a communist totalitarian dictatorship in any or all countries of the world through the medium of an internationally coordinated communist political movement. And they've been doing that, as we know, for quite a while. I mean, if you go and look, Karl Marx even wrote some letters, or uh, the communist faction wrote letters to Ing uh, Lincoln congratulating him. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's there's history of that. And then, uh, Kennedy even brought that up, uh, that, Kennedy, uh, that Marx had uh, ties to... America during that period of time, uh, you know, during reconstruction of the Civil War, so-called period. Uh, so this thing had been going on, and the secret societies controlled it, and uh, that's why I believe they killed uh, Kennedy, aside of reasons he uh, started to dig into the historic uh, happenings uh, with the communist takeover. So even though they put these... Uh, these uh, warnings or whatever you want to call them into title eight uh in the mid 1900s um the the, the ball had already been down rolling downhill 
long before that. So uh, they did it as, as another distraction. I, I think the McCarthy hear, hearings were just a dog and pony show to d- diffuse uh, all the uh, useful idiot um, happenings that were going on during that period of time with Hollywood, uh, you know, et cetera, being blamed uh, for being communist. And uh, really, the United States was already communist, and they were just uh, trying to defuse the uh, the situ- situation by throwing McCarthy under the bus. Uh, he went to a Jesuit school, and, uh, and he was, you know, used, I think, as a, a tool to uh, get to get you know, cover up what was going on so they could continue on the path of this world communist adventure they were <laughs> implementing, which is basically uh, fascism, world fascism. Yep, that's where we're headed. You know, there's one more thing I want to bring up here. And do you think we got to the place where the people were going to understand the danger we're in? I mean, we kind of went through the Jefferson Davis thing as a referential for uh, how we got to where we are now, basically, you know, building the case. Again, the 14th Amendment corrupted the um, the original organic Constitution to the point where they basically, you would look at the 14th Amendment as not an addition to the Constitution, but in fact the formulation of an entire, entirely new constitutional foundation. What it did is uh, created a de facto type government or corporation. Perfect. And uh, de facto corporations have to uphold the original principles, even though the, and that's what Section 3 does, it puts a new set of officers in, mm-hmm. in place. That's creatively what it, what it's doing. It's talking about the de jure officers, and then, you know, the the, the Congress takes a, or all the uh, state and whatever officers that work in government are taking an oath to uphold the Constitution as a de jure set. But when they do that, they automatically are the de facto set of officers. That's creatively what that whole section's doing. And they have to uphold the Constitution or they can't be in office. And that's the purpose of this paper. I explained it in there. But uh, they have to uphold... uh, you know, the de jure principles, and uh, they still do to a point, but what what they've done is it's given given them uh, basically free reign to do whatever they want. And that's why, uh, you know, there, there's, in law, there's, there's different ways of looking at things. Law is invisible until you look at a certain issue and it's brought up. Okay, so... Unless people bring these issues up, they they don't happen. So people are thinking they're acting under the original Constitution, uh, but as it doesn't it really exist, the Congress can pass laws based on their private law, based on the U- United States person, to uh, fulfill whatever agenda they have. And uh, I, I remember a couple years ago that, uh, I don't know who it was, but some congressmen wanted to uh, have mention of where they get the authority to pass a certain law into, uh, you know, into existence. Um, but it got shot down because every time they would pass a law, they would have to say the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> the Fourteenth. Well, you Amendment, mean the, the reference point? Amendment. Yeah, the reference. Yeah, the reference which gave them the authority to implement a law. So. They they couldn't do that. They couldn't let that happen. So so it was shot down, because like I said, every time they pass law, it'd be the Fourteenth Amendment, which is like you said a minute ago, the new Constitution. Yeah, the Constitution of the United States, not for the United States. So I, let's close this out because uh, we put a lot of concepts out there. I'll be. And the one thing we want to underscore here is that the people who hear this and the people who are going to encounter this material need to do something. They need to go to the PAC websites and you you will tell them where they're at. 
They need to begin to read the material. They need to also get a copy of the Red Amendment. I, I can't say enough how important it is to read this book. I will tell you it is not an easy read, but it's not written above the level of common understanding either. It's just you have to sit down and do diligence with it. And for that, it will reward you with perspective and the tools to begin actually thinking about law in a new way. So tell them where the websites are and um, how they can basically connect with PAC, PAC Alliance, the PAC and Law site, and all the other things that you're doing. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. It, it is very important. Um, like you said, I've had people tell me that the blinders come off when they read the book. Yes. So e e either the blinders come off or their cognitive dissonance kicks in big time. And they just don't want to believe they've been lied to. Uh, so that's the hump they have to overcome. And like you said, it's not an easy read, but... Uh, if you're willing to uh, accept the truth, it's not that bad. I mean, it, it's it becomes easier. But anyway, um, the book's available at uh, redamendment.net, and uh, it's uh, forty nine dollars now for a single copy. Uh, I'll be starting level two classes uh, soon. I hope uh, the interest has just been kind of bad i don't know how we can get people interested in this they seem to be distracted with a lot of things the last couple of years and uh i can't impress how much this is important like this paper needs to go viral it's called you have been warned that's what we're talking about tonight and uh the upcoming um you know suspension of the constitution and then they'll get away with it uh if we let them and uh, this paper needs to go viral, and I've noticed that people are not willing to take the time to understand these things. Uh, either they don't want to, or for whatever reason, and they won't share the information. I, I don't know if they think they're going to get trouble or um, they're going to be tagged, but if they're already complaining about government, they're already tagged. You know, uh, yeah. don't mean to make people paranoid or whatever, but... Uh, this thing is is obviously just it's diabolical and it's a, it ultimately you could say it's a joke so there, you're not going to get in trouble i i believe i was scared you know 15 20 years ago when i started investigating all these things but uh i've come to the conclusion that it, it, it's such a over joke what they've done that uh the more it gets exposed the more we can laugh at it, and it's really not funny, <laughs> even though it is. Yeah, but, well, uh, sometimes you uh, have to laugh, but, you know, it's not funny. Um, it, it's not funny at all, but it is a joke. And uh, I think uh, the more uh, people in government, uh, especially the, the people in state government, who don't un understand what's going on, get a hold of this, it will stop what they're they have planned um my for example my my mother says that there's there's no big conspiracy and i i say well there there is but there isn't no they don't sit down and give all these people in government and all the uh the governors uh direct orders every day but there are things that are going on at the top that they these people are doing and they're unconscious of doing they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and this paper will help them, ex you know, understand what they're doing and what's transpired. They and have then, then they can decide what side they're going to be on, the right side or the wrong side. Well, we have the ability to do what they did. They've organized for over 200 years through their secret societies and through their um, various associations. Do they take daily marching orders? No, they don't need to. There's been a plan in place for now 150 years to subvert the United States of America. And that plan is now in its final phases. And we have the ability to do an organi organizing campaign that brings people together to study and understand law, to implement law, and also, as the Red Amendment points out, to begin correcting our status back to uh, our original citizenship. And these are all 
these are all part and parcel of what PAC law is doing. Packet law, yes. Uh, it's important that we understand this. I mean, they're going for the no border concept. And you know how many people are preaching no borders, one human race. This is all new wor world order control or uh, propaganda. And uh, I think you and I talked about uh, government has to be local to be efficient. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this this world government thing is nothing but an extension of more uh, central government control and uh, to, you know, uh, enslave people. And uh, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people are waking up to that fact. Uh, the thing that they need to understand are the details of how these things work. Um, the only thing uh, that's opposite the rule of law is the, the law of the jungle. And basically, that's what these people want. They want the law of the jungle. That's what it's George. The, that's the, what George H. W. Bush said in 1993. Mm -hmm. They they want might, might makes right, and uh, yeah, they talked about the rule of law. We're we're for the rule of law. We're not. Uh, oh, we're, I don't like their political platform though. So, you know, we're not breaking any law. If that doesn't. Uh, help you understand you know that you you need to help with this we're not breaking any laws we're just exposing the vampire absolutely and um so with that you know we're going to kind of close out this session we're going to do some more of these over time lb and i are going to try and take some of the material from pack and as um it becomes pertinent we're going to put these out in the meantime visit the websites uh one more time with the w main website where they can go lb okay. yeah um pack alliance is the main website yeah it's getting about i don't know anywhere from eight to ten thousand unique visitors a month right now so that's at pack alliance dot us p a c a l l i a n c e dot us and uh there's a help page there if you need help finding things because the, the website or the web portal for PAC is huge. You could spend literally probably a year oh, on yeah. the website. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, researching there's... and looking at things. Now, yeah, you can find the help page at, uh, you know, the PACalliance.us slash help, H-E-L-P. Very good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, coming together with me tonight and putting this out and, uh, We'll return again real soon with a briefing from uh, the PAC Alliance. I'm Randy Moggins with LB Bork, signing off. <laughs>